when I was a kid. We uh, went to this church, a missionary alliance church, that was, that was uh, one of its core values, was sending missionaries, preparing missionaries, supporting missionaries. And, um, and every once in a while, we would have sort of special services where missionaries would come and speak to us, um, uh, talking about their ministry, what's going on in their life. And, um, and there was one particular Sunday in which a missionary was talking about what got them into the mission field. And, um, and it was the story of a man named Jim Elliott. Uh, Jim Elliott uh, was, was a, around basically in, in the 1950s, basically. And, um, and he was a missionary in South America to a tribe of Indians um, who were um, cannibals. And essentially, he... Uh, in his ministry, uh, got killed uh, and eaten by this tribe. And for some reason, I found that story really compelling. Um, it seemed to me like this man, Jim Elliott, was some kind of super Christian. And, and I wanted to be a super Christian. And, and the church, from time to time, and rightfully so, dips into the stories of the martyrs in order to encourage itself. Uh, hey, um, uh, look at these people who were just normal folks like you and I, but God used in a very powerful way, and they not only did not deny Christ at that critical moment, they affirmed him and were willing to give up their lives. And it's sort of like these, these people, the martyrs of the church, get put up on a pedestal, if you will, and I think that most people sort of look at that and they go, yeah, I don't know. Um, maybe one day I'll get there and I'd be willing to pray that at some point in my life I would get there. But I'm not sure I'm a super Christian. I'm not sure I'm, you know, James and John and, and Paul and, and, and all of those kind of. And, you know, um, in our sort of civic society, uh, we do the same thing. We call them patriots, but these were men who um, loved, you know, loved freedom more than life, who, who gave their life in service to their country, and we rightfully so, you know, tell their stories and pay our utmost respects. But if you join the military, you probably are not thinking to yourself, I want to be like that guy who charged the machine guns and got shot to ribbons, you know, shouting, give me liberty or give me death. Uh, you know, I, I'd like to do it some other way. I don't think uh, if a child said to their parent, mom, dad, I went to church this morning and I think I've got my call. Really? What was your call? I think God is calling me to be a martyr. I don't know what parent would be like, awesome. That's great. You know, like, what? Maybe God's calling you to be a doctor or a lawyer. There are many honorable professions in which God can use you to be a blessing all over the place. You don't have to be a martyr. And martyrs, for um, all intents and purposes, are um, uh, not something that we truly aspire to be. It's sort of something that we aspire that one day we will aspire, you know. Like one day, when I'm ready, you know, my 401k is locked in, my home's paid for, my kids are all grown up, they've gotten through college, they've got kids. Um, maybe when my grandkids are like teenagers and kind of, you know, going through that stage where they're, you know, giving everybody milk. Maybe then, maybe then I'll be ready, you know. Um, I think that's because we, uh, as a church, totally misunderstand um, what it means to be a martyr. And what I'm hoping is that this morning uh, you will realize that um, martyrdom is not this um, thing with mystique wrapped all around it. It's not this romantic thing for super Christians that one day the best of the best do that, but most normal people don't, you know. 
I will hope that you will see that being a martyr is um, actually a very basic Christian calling. Maybe the basic Christian calling. It, it is like the measure of saving faith. It's not something that God expects from, you know, the, the few, the proud, the martyrs. It's, it's something that he expects from all of his children, and reasonably so. And also, I want to sort of put into your mind that maybe being a martyr is way easier than you think and doesn't cost as much as you think. That's my whole goal this morning. It starts with the word, the word martyr. Of course, is an English word now, but it used to not be an English word. In the Greek, martus uh, means to be a witness, to have a testimony. Um, when you got called in front of the judge, you know, I saw so-and-so stealing this and stuff, you were a, a martus. You were a witness. And your job was simply to say what you saw. You know, to just say like, well, no, this is what actually happened. You know, I saw it. I was there. I experienced it. Um, we can see this word in Christian history. It's like the word deacon. A deacon means, in the Greek, uh, to diakonos, is a waiter, a, a, a servant, someone who waits tables, who, who serves other people food. Um, and then through the course of time, that word became so associated with a particular Christian office that we don't just translate the word, we transliterate the word, and it has its own meaning. A deacon has its own meaning. You don't go to the restaurant and call on a deacon, do you? No. You know, you go to a church and you ask like, hey, I, I'm going through some financial trouble or whatever. Do you, does your church have deacons? Can I speak with a deacon? Because they do, it's a church office. In the same way, martyr, which just means witness or to bear a testimony, to have a testimony, has come to mean to give one's life in, in the witness. To not deny that you know and love Jesus Christ and what he has done for you, even on pain of death. Um, the church used to call those people the holy martyrs. But now in English, um, martyr means something almost completely different. <clears throat> uh, in fact, I think we could all agree that if I said, you know so-and-so, and you're like, yeah, I think I know so-and-so, what a martyr, it would not be a compliment. There's a negative connotation. It means somebody who's sort of like, maybe in, in a very codependent way, trying to exalt all of their own suffering to make to manipulate other people to do what they want. And in fact... It sort of became a general term that could be applied, like in its clinical sense, to all religions anywhere. And, and so, um, the uh, fundamentalist Muslims, the extremists, call the suicide bombers, people who strap bombs to their chest and run into a, uh, a church into a marketplace and blow themselves up and lots of other people, they call them Muslim martyrs. They call them martyrs and, and, and lift them up as, hey, these are the guys who actually were willing to put their life on the line um, in order to advance our cause. And so um, we got to rescue this word. We got to rescue this word uh, because that's, that's not what it is. That's not what it means. That's not what God's calling us to. So I want to start um, in one of the most important Bible passages. Uh, of course, they're all important, but, um, but I'm so glad that uh, in the Gospel of John, uh, John gives us a theological framework for understanding this word, martyr, witness. So I want to read for you as introducing this idea theologically from John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word. Now, thankfully, the ESV has translated that and not transliterated it, but if I read it as a transliteration, it would say, in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God. Logos means communication, speaking, uh, a message. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. John is giving us the birth narrative of Jesus Christ, which starts in the beginning. In the very beginning of all time, there was Jesus, the word of God. And he creates for us a theological idea that means the very person of Jesus is a message from God. That's why we call him the word. And it's why we call the Bible the word of God, because it communicates a message to us, one of hope, one of salvation, one of incredible, passionate love. This is who Jesus is. And in every birth narrative of Jesus Christ, whether it's the book of Mark, where he doesn't give us when Jesus was born as a baby, but when Jesus stepped onto the scene of ministry, or Matthew or Luke, who give the actual birth narrative and, 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 and the genealogy, and here in John, he gives us sort of the theological understanding in all four of the Gospels, in the birth narrative, there is a man whose name is John. In every single one of the Gospels. So here, John the writer of this gospel is introducing us to the word of God and putting him in the most celestial, cosmological uh, categories that he can think of. And there, after verse 5, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Verse 6 reads, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This is John the Baptist, not John the writer here. In every single one of the birth narratives, there's this guy whose name is John the Baptist. He's part of the story of the advent of Christ. This man who was sent from God, whose name was John, he came as a witness. Let me transliterate that for you. He came as a martyr to bear witness, to be a martyr about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness, to be a martyr about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word, the Logos, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And wouldn't that be a marvelous place to stop? But John, the writer of the gospel, doesn't stop there. He says, John, as in John the Baptist, he bore witness about him. And cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. John's giving us, he's pointing to Jesus and he's saying, Jesus is the logos, the very word of God. But then he gives us another category that works with the Logos, the Logos and the Martyrion, the martyr, the witness. And and, and these two uh, things from God, the Logos of God, Jesus Christ, and his witnesses are always working hand in hand. They're here in the very birth narrative, but we will see throughout the New Testament, but particularly in the writings of the Apostle John, that this word, witness, martyr, is uh, starts to become like changed from someone who's just giving a testimony to someone who is giving their life in testimony. So that by the time we, we end the book of Revelation, or actually all through the book of Revelation, When John, in uh, because the same John is writing the book of Revelation, when he is writing about churches, he calls them witnesses. He calls them martyrs. And then he specifically, in Revelation chapter 2, names a famous martyr from uh, this church. 
and uh, whose name is Antipas. And he says, um, I know where you guys live. You live actually right where Satan dwells. But you've got a great witness. Um, and and I, I saw Antipas, the martyr, who was faithful to me. So, we need to first stop thinking about martyrdom as this great, amazing thing at the very end of the Christian life that if you get it, man, you rack up some good bonus points. But if you don't, it's no big deal uh, because only a few are called to be martyrs. And those people are given an insane special grace to be able to withstand in the hour of, of, uh, of their trial. But in fact martyrdom, uh, being a witness, is actually the very first thing that God requires of his children. In fact, um, if you are not a witness, it would be like, well, are you saved? Do you actually know God's saving love? Do you actually have faith in who Jesus Christ is? Because it's impossible to receive salvation and then not talk about it, not display it, not show it. It's not that big of a deal. So I want us here this morning to hear the call of the Holy Spirit to be martyrs. Why do we, as the church, put martyrdom off on this very far thing? You know, when I planted this church, I spent a good deal of time praying and consulting with other people who are very wise. Why do we, why should I plant a church in Spokane? And, and there was, there was one thing in particular that was very heavy on my heart. Spokane doesn't need another church. It's got lots of great churches, tons of them, really great churches. It doesn't need another church. It needs a church that's a little bit different. And I was trying to go before the Holy Spirit and say, how should we be different? And the Lord put on my heart, I want a church that is all about training martyrs. And I was like, I found it. This is the thing. I wrote my thesis paper uh, on that uh, as I was graduating from, from seminary. It's actually in the very foundational documents of the adopted church. If you go down to the bank and pull out our bylaws and our mission statement and all of that, being a martyr is in there. And um, one of the very uh, early influential people in our church, who's no longer with us, but at that time said to me, hey, I get what you're saying, but the way that you're saying it is going to turn a lot of people off. Like, like we need to have our primary message be like, come and get connected. Um, l- let's make disciples. Let's display the love of God. If you put the word martyr in there, nobody will come. Because, this is what he said, direct quote, those pancakes won't sell. I was like, great, great. But I don't want to be turned off of this primary calling that God has given us. And here's why. In the early church, you know that Christians were greatly persecuted. For the first 300 years of the church, Christians were hunted down and killed all over the place not only by their neighbors, but even by the government, by imperial decree. In almost every land that Christians went, they found themselves in opposition to the government. Because in those days, to be king was also to be God. That is what the pagans believed. It's what they taught people. From the days of old Pharaoh to the days of Caesar. They hailed Caesar not just as king, but as Lord God. And Christians said, no, he's king. And in every way, we will obey and submit and be a part of this, but he's not God. And they went into India, into the Far East, into Britannia, and in every place, the locals hated Christians because they could not trust someone who said like, no, 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 like, I'll be a part of your group here, but I'm not going to worship that person. He's a person. There is a God, and I know him. His name is Jesus. Can your king rise from the dead? I see your graveyards full of dead kings. Amazing how every single one of them ceases to be God when they die. 
and they bestow their godhood on the next guy who happens to be alive. No, I know the one true living king. He lives not only in my life, but in my heart. I speak to him all day long. I hear from him all day long. And I cannot, in good conscience, worship some pretender who's obviously a pretender. And so the Christians were rounded up and slaughtered and killed in, in every place that they went. Which is how Christians um, became, uh, like martyrdom became this big thing. How did Christians do that? I mean, I just want you to imagine that um, some government agency with three letters shows up to your house in the middle of the night kicks open your door, finds evidence of you being a Christian, hauls you off to jail, but jail's not good enough. We need to execute these people. Just executing them quietly is not enough. Let's fill up a stadium. Let's invite all of the people from from the city to fill up the stadium. We'll bring these Christians out into the middle and we will slaughter them or give them an opportunity to to worship Caesar instead. Spit on the crucifix, step on it, something symbolic. Offer a sacrifice to Caesar, and then we let him go. We have to show that these Christians are just normal people. They're not super people. And so that's what would happen. You'd get drug into the Colosseum, and they'd sick the gladiators on you or, or the wild beasts. And, and this is not something that just happened in Rome a long time ago. It's happening in our world today. All over the Middle East, Christians are being rounded up by their Muslim neighbors and having their heads chopped off. And in Asia, the governments of, of North Korea and China and, and every place the Marxists are, they hate the Christians and, and burn down their churches and, and kill them. And we, the American church, have, have, have become, uh, have, have become so spiritually fat and lazy, we think of martyrdom as this far off impossible thing that happens to other people. And if it ever does happen to me, like, I'll pray for the strength to undergo that trial. And they don't know that martyrdom is practiced in your day to day life. It's not a one time event at the very end that maybe you'll pass or maybe you won't. So the Christians had to uh, rely on uh, this bit of theology that also comes from the book of John. But Jesus says it in many different places. He says, like, if you follow me, you are going to have to accept death. If a man wants to follow me, let him pick up his cross and then follow me. For those who wish to save their life, they're going to lose it. But if you are going to lose your life for my sake, then it will be saved. And there is one particular story in the Bible, in the book of John, chapter 11, where uh, Jesus is um, going to raise Lazarus. A famous story, I hope you all, all know it, but, but basically, um, Lazarus is really sick. People who know Jesus really well, Mary and Martha, come to him and they say, hey, Lazarus is really sick, we know that you can heal, come and heal him. And Jesus says, I'm going to tarry. And he waits until a messenger comes and says, Lazarus has died. Jesus says, great. Disciples, let's pack up. We're headed down to Bethany. We're going to go wake Lazarus up. And the disciples were confused, and they're like, mm. if he's asleep, then that's good, because, you know, that means he's going to recover. And Jesus says, no, 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 I mean I'm going to wake him up. Jesus, if he's sleeping, then that means his body's recovering. He's like, no, no, no. You ding-dongs. He's dead. <laughs> Lazarus is dead. Um, but I'm going to wake him up. Now, Jesus says very emphatically in many different places, people who believe in me, if you believe in me, you don't die. And so I get a little bit irritated when I hear preachers preach this and they say that falling asleep, the Bible uses the terminology of falling asleep as a euphemism for death. It does not. The Bible in no place does that. It's saying that believers don't die. And so if one 
falls asleep, it means that their body is dead, but they are not. Jesus goes down and is confronted by um, Mary and Martha. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. They knew who Jesus was, but they didn't know something about him. That he is the commander of not just sicknesses and demons and like the low level stuff that we mere mortals have no control over, but that he's actually the creator of the universe. And John in his gospel wants to make that clear to us. So when Jesus is coming down to Bethany, Martha meets him on the way. This is John chapter 11. I'll be reading from verse 21. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, yeah, I know that he will rise again. In the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God who is coming into the world. Martha had such a flat theology of who the Messiah was. She saw him as this political liberator. She's like, like normal things that humans want when they sort of dream of utopia. That was what Jesus was going to give as the Messiah. But Jesus is saying, no, 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 I am God. And if you believe in me, those people who believe in me, they have already died and been raised again to new life. So one of the things that we in the modern church believe that's a little bit different, a subtle shift from the way the disciples and the apostles and the church fathers understood life and death, we are sort of like, at the moment of my salvation, I'm given a coupon, a spiritual coupon that's like a get-out-of-jail-free card. And then one day I'll die, and it'll be really scary, but in my spiritual pocket, I have this get-out-of-jail-free card. And then in the resurrection, on the last day, when I stand before God on his judgment throne, I whip out my get-out-of-jail-free card, and it says Jesus on it. And I'm like, is this good here? And he's like, yes, it is. Come on in. Wahoo! And while it gets a number of things right, the thing that it misunderstands is that eternal life is not something to be had. At some far off date, it's something to be had now. It is something that Jesus does in us now so that you can be physically alive but spiritually dead. But at the time of your conversion, you become not only physically alive but spiritually alive. And that in some way we do not understand, believers never experience physical death. Now, they knew that their bodies would perish. But believers were like, but when my body dies, I'm not in it. Not, I experience death, and because I experience death, I am set free from the bonds of this body, and I go to be with the Lord, and then at some point he gives me a new body, but no, Christ will come and get me before I die. I will not experience the feelings of what it feels like to die. And it's so weird that believers would be so focused on this in the early church and be so unconcerned about it now. But when you understand that their physical lives were on the line, they were very happy that Jesus said, those who believe in me will never die. Do you believe this? So then Jesus actually raises Lazarus from the dead. He had been dead for four days. So he was really dead. And when you start asking the questions like, well, then where was his spirit during that time? Where was, I don't have a good answer for you. All I know is that Jesus says, those who believe in him will never die. But are already alive in him. And so, in Scripture, but also in all, or nearly all, of the stories of the martyrs from the early church, there's this weird feature where the believer who's being killed for their faith actually falls asleep right before they die. 
So I'm going to read from you from uh, Acts chapter 7, just uh, six verses, verses 54 through 60. This is the account of Stephen and his martyrdom being killed for his faith. So he gets, you know, drug in front of this trial, and it's everybody knows we're going to kill him regardless of what he says. And when he uh, tells them, you guys are unrighteous, and what you are doing now is just part and parcel of the way you live. You persecuted all of the prophets. You killed Jesus the Messiah. Of course you're going to kill me. You're not out for doctrinal purity. You guys are a stiff-necked and a stubborn people. And you are actually opposed to God. And in verse 54, uh, the story picks up now. When they heard these things, they were enraged. Well, yeah. And they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. And they cast him out of the city and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And then um, I sort of had planned to read to you uh, a few accounts of early martyrs and in all of them, the believer is relieved from going through death right before it happens. And I think this is important. If we are going to reclaim martyrdom, if we're going to say, no, God is calling me to be a martyr, and don't misunderstand what it means, then we have to take away the final stick that the enemy always wields against the believer and says, if you don't, I will. Now, there are a lot of other sticks in his arsenal that he will use. I will ridicule you. I will cause you to lose your social status. I will harm you. You'll lose your job. You won't be able to buy and sell. You'll be scorned. You'll be cast out. People will hate you. People will beat you up. They'll be violent against you. And all of those things, um, yes, believers do go through those things. But the last big club that the enemy thinks he's holding, I will kill you, that stick isn't there. God does not ask his children to walk through death in faith, but saves them from that trial. So that is why Peter and Paul and and um, all of the disciples and apostles, John, are like, so what are you afraid of? Like, what are you afraid of? If you're afraid of dying, that only means that you don't really understand what Jesus has done for you. Uh, so, in the very beginning of the church, When someone would believe in the Lord Jesus, they would be immediately baptized. So we'll think of like uh, Philip with with the eunuch of Ethiopia. I don't understand what I'm reading. Oh, that text is about Jesus who came and died just a few days ago. Didn't you hear about that? And the eunuch was like, I believe. Now, what is going, why should I not be baptized? And so they come upon some water. Philip baptizes him and, and he goes... Uh, but, but what started happening was as the Christians were getting more and more persecuted, these people who had, who had been baptized and believed and converted, when pressed with the spear to their belly, being like, do you really believe, you know, deny that you serve Jesus and offer a sacrifice to Caesar or we'll kill you, an astounding number of people apostatized. They decided, eh, I'm going to lean on God's forgiveness for this one. Um, All right, I don't know who Jesus is, and um, here's a sacrifice. And in their heart, they're going, Lord Jesus, please forgive me for this. I'm not strong enough yet. I'm not whatever. 
And the church was never actually really concerned with whether or not that person was actually really saved. What the early church was concerned with was the witness. Because to have a Christian turn away at the last minute was disastrous because it confirmed to the Romans everything that they thought about the Christians, that they were hateful and evil and all this sort of stuff. So when they would get someone and threaten them with torture, when they go, yeah, the Christians are, you know, they're nutsos, I'm not one of them, here, I'll blah, 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 and step on the cross or do whatever because I fear for my life, the Romans would go, see, I knew they were like that. But when a Christian was like, kill me, you can't kill me. The Romans were like, yes, we can. Watch. You know, they're like, oh, you didn't kill him. He's alive eternally. You might have caused his body to fail, but he never died. So we have to protect our witness. So then the church stopped baptizing people right away. They thought, we gotta make sure, because baptism is actually a, a celebration, it's a, it's a, um, a ceremony, a rite, a sacrament, in which we believe through faith that we, when we get put down into the water, we are actually in our spirits being united to Jesus Christ in his death. And when the preacher pulls us up out of the water, we believe that we are actually spiritually being united to Jesus Christ through faith in his resurrection. And then from that moment, you never die. So the church was like, in order to make sure that we don't have people apostatizing all over the time and ruining our witness, we need to go through this uh, period of testing to see whether or not they would pass that test. And then they would not baptize someone unless they were relatively convinced that that person would not apostatize when threatened with death. And so baptismal fonts started appearing. They wouldn't just go down to the river and baptize them, this or that. What they would do is they would recreate in miniature the Colosseum. They called it a baptismal font. So it's circular, and it's got kind of ledges like this down into the water. There's a staircase that goes down on one side and a staircase that comes out on the other. Because in the Colosseum, when everybody filled up the Colosseum, the Christians would be dragged through the life gate. They'd open the life gate. They called it the life gate. They had inscriptions on it that said life gate. And everybody who was alive would get ushered into the arena. Then they'd close the life gate. Then they would sick the gladiators on them or the wild beasts on them. And after everybody was dead, they'd open up the death gate. And it was written over the top, death gate. And they'd drag the Christians out. So when Christians would go to be baptized, they would walk down a staircase labeled death gate. And they would walk into the waters and they would be put into the water and drawn back up again. And they would say, you are alive now. And, it, and, and no matter what happens to you in the Colosseum, you are alive. And they would walk out the life gate. We sang about that this morning, didn't we? He opened the life gate that all may go in. And so, so it sort of transformed baptism to be a representation that someone was actually willing to die for their faith. They were ready to be a witness, to be a martyr. And so instead of reading these stories of martyrs uh, for you, I will just say that the um, in the martyrdom of Ignatius, uh, who was essentially, who was an apostolic father. The apostles were all dead by this time, but he was in their seat. And when he um, was finally caught, betrayed, and being brought to Rome to be fed to the wild beast, he wrote letters to Christians that were praying for him, and he insisted to them, I am not going to pass the ultimate test I am being brought to Rome to see if I can pass the most basic test. And I have been a preacher and a teacher for a very long time. But I want you to pray for me that I would not fail at the decisive moment because Jesus commands that all men die in their sins. And those who believed are raised to new life. So he says, I, I, I just want you to know, I'm not resisting this thing anymore. I've lived a full life. Now it's time for me 
to go show you what a, a, a very be- beginner Christian does. This is not for advanced Christians. This is for beginner Christians. And that I might be an example to you that you would not be discouraged when you see me die, but you would be fortified. You'd be made ready. So, I want to end by talking about how the enemy discourages martyrs. Or how he discourages people who should be martyrs into not being martyrs. First, the devil, the world, they always focus on what you're going to lose. And so, because being a martyr is something that you practice for a long time before the you actually might face the test, you're dying to your sin, you're dying to your own wants and desires, You are living in love for your neighbors and for the Lord, and you are practicing the laying down of what's good for me. And you are picking up what is good for the other. And that is actually all that martyrdom entails, is just doing that. But in doing it, you die. Your body dies, I should say. Here I am breaking my own rules. So what the enemy does is he says, think about what you're losing. And like, you don't have to think about yourself right now, you know, someplace in the forest on your knees with some dude with a gun to your head and, and thinking about it that. You can actually think about martyrdom like right now and like, you know, I know a number of you are facing because of your religious convictions, losing your job. And then the, and what the devil does is he says, think about all that you're losing. Think about all that you're losing. You're going to lose this. 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 All of these things you're going to lose. And the enemy is so good at taking a little bit of truth and perverting it into a wicked, wicked deception. Because like, if you look at what he did in the garden to Adam and Eve, he never really lied. He deceived for sure. But everything that he said, in a way, was true. And like, it is true. You probably will lose your job. But Jesus, what he does is he focuses us on what we shall gain. And all of our apostles, even Jesus Christ himself, said, I'm setting my eyes on the finish line. I am fighting for the crown of life. I know what I will gain is far greater than any physical thing on this earth. Like Paul says in Romans chapter 8, um, I don't, count the agony, the suffering on behalf of Christ to even be compared to the glory that's waiting for me. So the enemy will say, like, look at what you're losing. But the spirit says, but look at what is to be gained. The enemy does everything they can to amp up fear. Fear, I think properly defined, is sort of like, guessing at all of the bad things that might happen rather than, like, actually what's going to happen. And so in every place that the enemy is working, he takes the what if and cranks it up to 11 and gets everybody talking about the what if, what if, what if, what if, what if, oh my goodness, let's all kill ourselves now because what if? That's not the way of God. And so, like, uh, what I read for the call to worship, Peter says, um, hey, beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. And then he sort of talks about all the things that, yeah, will probably happen to you. As long as they're not happening to you because you're actually a bad person, you know. If you're stabbing people or stealing things from people and then the cops come and take you away, don't try to slap Jesus on the top of it and be like, oh, I'm suffering for Christ. No, you're suffering because you did the wrong thing. But, but if you are being a faithful witness and you're being, you're actually suffering on behalf of Christ, then like, don't be surprised about it. Stick through it. Stick with it. And, um, 
there is great glory and salvation to be had. So he closes out chapter 4 in verse 19. He says, therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. The way that the enemy amps up our fear is he sort of um, causes there to be a blank spot where God and his goodness is. I might lose my job. I might that because of that, I might lose my house. I might um, have an incredible amount of difficulty with my spouse. Um, my kids might go hungry and then turn to drugs and prostitution and, you know, and, 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 and. And so what starts out as like, hey, I might not be able to work here anymore, in our minds turns into this, this burden that is too great to bear. And if you can't focus your attention on what might be gained, at least turn your attention to our creator, God, who is faithful and good. And like he owns all of the things. And he has many agents all over the place working good on his behalf. I think I can trust him. And as for, you know, my wife and I thinking about like, hey, what's going to happen if I lose my health care coverage? That's going to be disastrous. And I can immediately say, and if not immediately, a few minutes later say, yeah, that would be bad. But um, God can do anything he wants. And like, I can trust him to take care of my illness. And you know, maybe by being faithful and maintaining my witness in my suffering, God will be like, you're ready for your healing. You know, maybe that. And then we can start doing what the enemy does by saying, what if, what if, what if in the negative? We can start saying, what if in the positive? Oh man, what if there's a better job for me? Uh, what if instead of being persecuted at my place of business, I'm praying with my coworkers? What if there's a promotion in my future? What if, like, God can play that game too? And, like, I think that's okay. Lastly, I, I want to um, give to you a uh, two more verses. Uh, one from Hebrews chapter 12. And now... Instead of using the word witnesses, uh, as is here, I will use the word martyrs, um, because that is in the Greek. Uh, so the author of Hebrews is trying to encourage the persecuted church to not quit, to not give up. And, and he talks about all of these great martyrs from the Old Testament and that, they, that the church had personally known. And he says, therefore... Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of martyrs, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. What an amazing message. What an amazing, those martyrs, those martyrs, they did not die. They are not buried in the ground somewhere. They are all around us on their march to glory, and we will join them. Shall we not join them having endured? Lastly, I want to read to you from the uh, last couple of verses in the Bible from the book of Revelation, which is giving sort of this amazing picture of what is to come. And, um, and, it test and it testifies over and over that the spirit, the spirit in our hearts, in the church, says something over and over and over, especially in response to persecution and being put to death for one's faith. The church has one word that it says over and over and over. In verse 20 of Revelation 22, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. It's the end of the quote. And the author says, amen, period. Come, Lord Jesus. The spirit and the church say, come, Lord Jesus. Come. And that in the end, is the thing that is required for us to embrace our witness, for the world to be transformed by the witness of the church 
It is the way that God finally defeats Satan and all of his armies through the simple witness of the church, through you and I being martyrs on the lowest level and on the highest level, that as we practice the laying down of our rights and wants and desires and pick up the cross of Jesus as our hearts are are beating and crying out, come, Lord Jesus, come, that even though there may be great suffering, that is not the end of the story. But God uses the suffering and the persecution of the church to convince our neighbors who are lost in darkness that there is a God, that he does love us, and that his way for us is faithful and true. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we ask that you would cause us to be moved deep in our hearts that the person of faith, sometimes buried way down deep inside of us, would boldly step forward in our hearts, that we would love you, that we would be filled by your spirit, that we would be confident enough to say, come, Lord Jesus, come. We pray for our neighbors. We pray for our community. We pray for our state. We pray for our nation. We pray for our world, which it feels like it is becoming lost evermore in darkness. But we know, Lord God, that when the darkness is at its darkest, you cause your people to shine their brightest. And we know that the darkness cannot overcome the light because Jesus Christ died, was buried, but he is resurrected and reigning at the right hand of God the Father. We pray that you would give us courage, that you would give us freedom, that you would cause us to be able to be martyrs in your name. We pray these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.